Okay, guys, warm welcome to you all to the Dutch-German Cultural Dialogues, an initiative of the Genootschap Nederland-Duitsland and the Duitsland Institute. My name is Hanko Jurgens and I'm working at the Duitsland Institute. And we are very glad that Sascha Wald and Hetty Berg are here. Uh, the idea is that we invite uh, either a German or a, a Dutch uh, artist or curator and ask him or her who inspires you, who is for you a, a good example, uh, with who do you like to talk and to enter in discussion with. Uh, uh, so we really have a a, a discussion about Dutch-German uh, culture and the transnational and cross-cultural boundaries between these cu cultures. And we, uh, as organization, wanted to be surprised uh, by the choice of the person uh, who we invited. Uh, and the first person we asked for this series was Hetty Berg. Uh, she is the uh, director of the Judicis Museum in Berlin. Uh, she studied dance for four years in London and Amsterdam and studied theater and cultural man in Amsterdam and cultural management in Utrecht. And in 1989, she became the curator of the Jewish, then Jewish Historical Museum, museum today we call it, Jewish Museum here in Amsterdam. In 2002, she was appointed manager and chief curator at the Jewish Historical Museum. And in 2020, at the start of the COVID crisis, uh, she became the director of the Jewish Museum in Berlin. And one of the first things she could do was open a new permanent exhibition uh, uh, there. Um, and we indeed we asked uh, Hetty Berg, with who do you want to talk to? And we were very surprised, positively, of course. Uh, Hetty told us that she didn't want to talk to somebody she knew already within her uh, circles, somebody we could expect, but she wanted to talk to Sasha Waltz. Um, Sasha Waltz studied from 1983 to 1986 at the School for New Dance Development in Amsterdam. Almost simultaneously, you both studied dance in Amsterdam. Uh, and later on, she studied also in New York. And together with Jochen Sandig in 1993, she founded the company Sasha Waltz and Guests with uh, a, a, a very busy program, uh, more than 300 artists and ensembles from the field of architecture, visual arts, choreography, film, design, literature, fashion and music from uh, th more than 30 countries have collaborated as guests on over 80 productions uh, and uh, dialogues, projects and films. And uh, the company stages 12 active pieces uh, per year and about 70 performances each year. Uh, and she's a very well-known uh, German choreographer. Uh, and the first question is, of course, to Hetty. Why did you want to talk to Sascha Waltz? Um, first of all, I love dance and I love contemporary dance. And I'm extremely impressed uh, by, uh, the, by Sascha Waltz and her choreography choreographies and her company, although I haven't seen that many works live, but, um, and um, I wanted to uh, invite somebody who is not from the scene that I am in, in Germany. So I could have taken a museum colleague, but most of those people I know already, or I could have taken somebody from the Jewish scene and a Jewish author. Uh, I also had, you know, I, I thought of several names and I thought, oh no, I found it myself a bit, uh, not boring, but a bit um, expected. So I thought, oh, I want to, I want something totally different. And then I thought of, uh, of uh, Sasha also because um, I know that we studied at the theater school or studied dance at the same time or almost the same time. Now I found out that I had just stopped dancing when you started here in, in Amsterdam. Um, but, uh, 
and also because when the Jewish Museum uh, was built, the the new building of Daniel Liebeskind, and it was not uh, not there was no exhibition yet, but it was already open for the public. Uh, Sasha Waltz uh, made a choreography in the empty building, so there was another connection between us, an unknown connection. Um, and on top of that, uh, one of my best friends studied with Sasha Waltz here in Amsterdam, who, with whom I worked for many, many years in the Jewish Museum. So there are many unexpected connections. And uh, when at the moment when I stopped with the Nell Rose Academy, that was a, a teacher training um, program, because I thought, no, I cannot the rest of my life to say to little children that they have to keep in their belly and their bum and, you know, the classical thing. I thought, no, I cannot go on with that. And then I was very, or another dream of mine was maybe to become a modern dancer. So I went also to Rotterdam to see there the dance academy. So always when I see choreographies like this, I always think, oh, you know, I could have done that. I would have loved to have done that, you know, so it's, and of course, if you have danced so long, because I did it since I was four, you know, it's always when you watch a choreography, you feel it in your body, you know, it's kind of, uh, although you cannot do it, but it's like you experience it in um, a very, uh, very physical many, manner. So these are some of the <laughs> reasons why I thought this is, I wanted to speak with Sasha Wells, and I'm very, very uh, honored that you followed the invitation. Very nice. And uh, so you, you, you told us the, about the, the, the dance in the empty building, the performance was called one, one of the dialogues, one would say. What exactly did you like about it? Could, can you, how did it inspire you, this, the, the performance of, of Sasha Waltz? Well, I was not the, there. Yeah. No, but you um, saw it on... But now, yeah, I saw it, and it's, it's amazing, because I... Um, and what is also interesting, I think it's one of the first times that you made a choreography in, an arch in, an, in architecture, and that really became a kind of signature of yours. I mean, I've seen others uh, amazing, uh, where buildings are being... Um, I don't know how you say that, by a choreography. Uh, but it was so interesting because I have never seen the museum building totally empty. And I, tr I thought, oh, this is there and there. But then I thought, oh, no, oh, no it's not. You know, it's, it's, it's a, very, um, a very special, um, a very loaded building with all the symbolism of the, of, of the German Jewish history that, uh, that has vanished, or German Jewish culture that has vanished uh, because of the Shoah, because of the Holocaust, and that is all very imbued in the architecture, and also anyhow German Jewish history. This is what Liebeskin tried to do, and yeah, it's just very special to see that then again interpreted uh, by by moving bodies and by a choreography. Did it one, in one way or the other inspire you in the museum as a director as well, or is that a, goes that a little bit too far to say that? Well, when when they were changing the when the museum was closed and the whole exhibition was redone, at a certain point the axes were also empty and the vitrines, and then I was thinking about you know these people within the vitrines that had been dancing there, which is of course very tempting. <laughs> To uh, um, yeah. So, Sasha, you. Uh, it is one of your. It is your first dialogue, I think, if I understand it well. And uh, a lot of dialogues followed. For example, in the Elb Philharmonie, uh, Neue Museum. Uh, there are many places where you made such a choreography in a in an empty building. Uh, could you s say something about? Uh, the performance in this building of Daniel Liebeskind. Yeah, yeah I'm also very, um, I'm, yeah, I'm very touched by the invitation and also by the connection. And I think it's very beautiful. Also, um, I, 
I enter a new um, age also. For myself, I just turned 60. And I feel it's very interesting also to look where you come from, what has inspired you, where have you learned, where, what influences are there in your life. And definitely um, Amsterdam and um, the education was a very, very... Um, important in my, uh, in my life and what I continued. So I'm very happy to find this link back and, and talk with you. Um, it might be, sorry to ask, it might be part of your concept in that sense that you cooperate with a lot of experts on various fields. Uh, and uh, you work together with architects. Uh, with, um, uh, so this, this form of dialogue uh, suits you very well. I, yeah, I also thought it's very interesting to meet you in Amsterdam while you are working in Berlin, and we haven't met in Berlin. And uh, so I thought this is a very... Um, yeah, it, it, it was just interesting and... Um, the dialogue idea is really, I actually, for the uh, first project that I did in Berlin, which was a grant at an art um, house, Künstlaus Britannien, which is a former uh, hospital and church also, and is basically for visual artists. But I made an application for um, a project that is... Um, dialogue with different arts, so with dancers, with um, visual artists, with musicians, and I did five dialogues in the beginning. And um, so I don't, I don't number them. So, but it was the next one after this was um, um, the dialogue in the Jewish Museum, and it was exceptional because the building. Uh, and also what the building represents um, for the city of Berlin. Uh, I think it's very, uh, mm, very exceptional. And it was <clears throat> in the year 99, where you have to imagine it's a huge building uh, and spectacular building. Uh, at that time, I would say one of the most interesting new architectures in Berlin, which we are not so lucky to have many. <laughs> but... Um, it was empty. The, there were different reasons, but for whatever reasons, I thought it was a very interesting concept to start uh, with an empty building, because in an empty building, you fill it with your, also with, with your imagination and with your history also. So it, had, it has an incredible potential. So it was not just watching the building, but I think it, there was a reflection also what this building might be in the future. Um, and so for me, as a German artist, um, it was also uh, the first time I confronted um, the history of uh, German and uh, Jewish history um, so dedicated in a work. And that was very confronting to me. And I didn't want to literally um, talk about... Uh, like storylines, I wanted to find a different way. Um, and so I, as the building was empty, I also um, worked with um, nude bodies. Um, and um, one of the crucial ideas, which I find very fascinating, I have not seen it in any other building uh, or museum, is the idea of a void. In the center of the, I don't know if we can say center, but very uh, central, there is a big void that connects from the bottom to the ceiling. And um, this is like memorating the big void that was, um, uh, that was created um, and uh, to memorize it with nothingness, which... I think this was such an incredible, strong statement. And um, there is also a Holocaust tower. When we um, went through the whole building, I left that because that was for me like untouchable. But the void was um, though a place where I also wanted to confront myself. And so basically we did a parkour through the whole building and trying to find also some sort of um, physical, tangible, feelable, vis visceral answer to the horror. 
but at the same time also give space for people to experience it. Um, so uh, it was a very special, for me, very special uh, encounter. And um, I continued, this was actually a research. And then from this uh, experience, I went, uh, because I was appointed um, director, co-director with uh, three other artists at the Schaubühne am Leniner Platz. And um, this was the... Um, the step before the creation, which was called Körper then Body. And many issues that, many questions that I had to ask myself in the museum then also uh, entered uh, into the, this project that was then uh, premiered in uh, January 2000. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are going to look at it because we have a small piece of it, but I'm not sure if we have the noise. Noise. The music. The music. Yeah, sorry. It might be noise. There might be noise, but the music. It is yes. actually electronic music. Yes, it's an that's... installation artist, Hans Peter Kuhn, um, very interesting artist that has also created um, a line of sound, a sound score through the whole building, uh, with very very small uh, microphones, and. Um, there is also one scene, there was one scene with a drum, but I think it's not in this excerpt, I think. That's the percussion. You hear it.
So this was a real dialogue, one could say, with the building as well. I mean, your other dialogues have a totally different atmosphere, different choice of music as well. <coughs> and uh, you really, uh, this, it's also very sober. Uh, yeah. And that, that was, it was there also public? Yes, uh, you saw, I think, one time. Um, yeah. Um, <coughs> Okay. It was just for very few people could attend it. Huh? Sorry. There were just very few people that were able to attend, and they were following, I think, through the building. Um, yes. No, sorry. I heard something. Yes, I heard something. Yeah. Ah, great. <laughs> but I was. I'm also uh, curious uh, to know where the idea came from to do this, and, or who took the initiative. And because I will talk a bit till your cough, <laughs> so uh, uh, because it's uh, it, in a way this um, the the fact that the building could be visited when it was empty is really took on kind of mythical proportions. So almost everybody that meets me and know, hears that I'm the director of the Jewish Museum Berlin, they say, oh, I visited the building where it was empty. <laughs> it was, <laughs> you too. It was so beautiful. And then they never came again because they had seen it. They had seen the building. I always say, well, you know, it was not meant to stay empty. So maybe you, you come by once more and to see what it is like now. But of course, it was very very special, and, um, but I'm very curious to know how this came about, this idea. Um, well, I really like research, so, um, so there was this um, idea, um, there's one of the curators um, or, um, that was at that time responsible, said, you know, it's empty, maybe you find it interesting, and um, we went also through the building site first, and um, I, I took myself one year preparation for this opening piece. And so um, I'm very I'm very inspired by architecture in general, and so this was like an exceptional moment um, to happen. So it was not like I said I want this building. It was more um, being open. I did a second um, dialogue, actually, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was even before uh, this one in our, at that time, our theater, which is Sophienseele, it's in Mitte, which is an old uh, Versammlungssaal, also Rosa Luxemburg talked there. Um, it's a, a space for dance and performing arts, and it still exists. We founded it in 1996, and we were at that time there. And so I did one dialogue also in the whole building, and I also kept it completely empty, and also guided the public through the museum. I was very interested to have the public also part of the choreography, part of, um, yeah, of the the line of let's say of the dramaturgy also, and also the proximity. I think it is something very different that you can experience when you uh, create in architecture or in buildings, you can have the public very close. So it gets something very intimate. Um, and so there also I worked like this. And I had also, which was is kind of the connecting link between um, Jewish Museum and Sophienseele, I created like an altar uh, image um, in the windows, that there are glass windows um, in the in the theater, and they have double double windows, and it's just about like a meter in between. So I I filled it with um, also with bodies, so it resembled like uh, ancient uh, altar paintings somehow, because they were kind of also like in in triptych triptych uh, relationship. And so when I came to the Jewish Museum, I was also very curious about the vitrines, um, where we knew there will be objects depicted, um, but I decided to depict, to depict the bodies, you know, that bodies become the object. And um, so that was a very, <laughs> um, yeah, and 
and actually this line I continued in also in Körper, it's um, like a very long scene, which is the vitrine in the, in the um, wall, part of the wall. And also the set is very inspired by, um, by Jewish Museum. It's not white, it's a black triangle, huge nine meter high wall but it's very much inspired uh, by this. And you saw this also because the openings and the angles are very um, <clears throat> specific because a lot of things are on triangle, um, these long lines that are crossing. Um, I just wanted to maybe explain one thing to the video. You saw the man um, in the void and the content actually that was that I was busy with is um, the resonance, because it's a, a you, you even heard there the sound quite well, I think. And these are the, is the sound of his body, it's the sound of his bones, because the bo bone is hollow and it resonates. And so for me, this was somehow one of the ways to translate also the horror or like our, yeah, also the, also the fragility of the body, its endlessness, and you know, all the associations that go about is to make the, the, the music, actually the sound from the body, the flesh and the bones. Can I react to that? Because it was very sweet that the librarian who brought me the DVD, he said he had been there uh, during the performance and he said, I felt so bad for the dancers because this concrete was so cold and their bodies and it was so hard and it must have hurt, etc. So he really still now had this memory of being there and exactly this, uh, this aspect. And what I also find um, what is interesting in the building that even uh, without the dancers, um, because the, the floors are uneven and all the lines are, are not perpendicular. So if you walk there, you know, you, it, it slants and you have to walk a bit up and uh, you're really put off your balance, or you put off balance and people get it disoriented. And also in the, there's a part which is called uh, the Garden of Exile where it's extreme and you really, you know, you feel very, sometimes dizzy, etc. So also the architecture, uh, with the architecture, Daniel Liebeskind really wanted the visitor to have a physical experience, which is in that part where you, what we saw here, uh, is also very present till today. And is it, does this building uh, uh, fit to the purpose of the museum in that sense that the, that the museum uh, wants to show Jewish culture? and not only the horrors where you talked of. Well, this is, um, this is the, the part that is underground, which are three axes, the axis of, um, the axis of uh, exile, axis of, of the Holocaust and axis of continuity. And that kind of sets the, the scene about uh, yeah the whole culture that has been lost with the voids. There are several voids in this building, and he built the building around these voids. Um, and uh, but then you go up uh, very high stairs, and there are two floors uh, that are not slanting. I mean, still all the windows are like this, and all the walls are like that. Uh, but there are the the history of 1,700 years of. Jews in the German lens is told, and there, of course, it's much more also about the Jewish culture. I mean, these, these centuries-old uh, history with with all its downs, but also, luckily, also many ups, uh, very rich, and also till today, because there's still Jewish life today. But the fact, and I also, I do have sometimes some... Um, yeah, problems with that is that the visitor starts down there, and this is also what most visitors know when they come, is the, is the Holocaust, is the murdered Jews, and they're kind of uh, this, 
this idea is kind of confirmed there. And I always hope, because there's so much to see there already, the garden and the Holocaust Tower. I think sometimes people also leave after that, because there's also a lot of material in the vitrines, all pertaining to the Holocaust, so they never get up there where we tell about Jewish life. So it's, and of course, because it's such a remarkable and unusual architecture with all the, there are hardly any straight um, uh, angles, etc. It's also quite difficult to uh, to build exhibitions in there. But there you can see in 2020, we opened a new core exhibition. So the one of, of 2001 was taken away in 2017, and in 2020, a new one was um, was built, and there you can see that in those 20 years that the museum existed, the curators really got to know the building and also learned to deal with all these angles, etc. So it is now, uh, it's much more um, um, a samuspel uh, of the architecture and uh, the design and the exhibition architecture uh, than it was before there. They just tried to hide all these funny windows, you know, with very big screen prints, etc. And now the, the designers did a very good job by really yeah, playing with the architecture. Uh, so I think it's also experience. And would it make sense to make a new performance with the collection for you? Or in the sense that you have the whole Jewish history uh, with it or not? For me? Or for you. For, for, for you. I mean, you made a performance in the empty building, but the building is now filled with uh, a lot more stories. Mm. <clears throat> Actually, I have, um, I have something in mind that <clears throat> for, for quite a long time, because... I work since many years. Uh, we are now in the actually in the 30th year of the company. I work with uh, Israeli dancers uh, over many many years, and have very very good friends. Um, and I, uh, I somehow I'm. It's still working. It's not yet uh, something that is really clear. I think it's the first time I talk about it in public. Um, but I would really like to do something more in the city about um, where spaces were that had importance and that are not so visual in our um, daily life. I mean, we have the Stolpersteine, <clears throat> as, which is a very amazing uh, memory and also artist that created that. But uh, still, you have the, the name and... Um, usually the, the birth and death, but uh, there are many buildings also, and somehow I'm dreaming more of something and um, like a tour, you know, where, and also to work um, with, especially, in, I, I work with an international group of dancers, but maybe to do something really specifically in an exchange, um, also from their perspective, because most of the dancers I encountered, they are like third generation, so they emigrated, uh, grew up in Israel, and then um, came back, and a lot of them stayed in uh, in Europe or in, in Berlin also. And uh, so, what what can that, what does that mean, and uh, what what lines can you draw there? What stories? And for me, I think it would be very. I always like also to work with artists and tell their story, to be very close, very personal somehow. Then now to, um, do you know what I mean? Uh, for me it would be very, um, there would be already everything inside their story somehow. And um, this is something that I have in me that I want to do sometime. And is it part of your... <laughs> yeah. You can work together. <laughs> yeah. Is it part of your uh, new concept of travelogues, this, that you travel through Berlin? Mm, yeah, I mean, some... Dance along the traces of history? Or? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I do sometimes. Uh, I just did also um, like a parkour through a city uh, in, uh, in Mal. I did it um, with my last piece. Um, that was actually uh, on eight stations that are architectural important, 
because some of the, um, like Hans Rarun, for example, he, he built a school there and uh, with also with a, a concert hall. And that was almost at the same time where he uh, built the Philharmonie in, in Berlin. They're kind of related. It's a smaller version. And they're like icons of, um, of uh, architecture, actually also Dutch architects, that after World War II came there to build a new democratic city. And um, um, I was asked by the people of the city um, to invent something that um, brings back the value of these precious buildings that now kind of are not anymore so appreciated. And so I did a parkour with stations and um, the civil society, so children and elder people, everybody who wanted was learning a part of my, one of my works, my latest works, in C it's called. And then at the end, all these eight groups came together on the marketplace. And it was like a, it was like a procession through their city. And more and more people joined and we had bells and flags and it was very cheerful, like celebrating their city. And in the end, people from um, really uh, also difficult area, areas because it's a very uh, large migrant society, um, they gathered there and um, it, um, uh, 10 of my dancers participated. So it was a mix of, um, yeah, somehow more like a communal project. And that was very rewarding. So in that sense, something like traveling through a city, recognizing what a city can mean for the inhabitants, it's, it's something that interests me. Yeah. So like reaching out of the theater. Uh, you know, we have to usually, you, the public, has to come to the theater. But also we can go and the city can be our theater. This is something that interests me. Do you recognize this as a director and curator of the museum, this forms of dialogue, uh, communicating with the city? Uh, it's, it looks a little bit like the, a project of a museum director in another way. Yeah, there are, of course, um, examples also of museums that, that reach out. I mean, here also in... In, the, in Amsterdam, at a certain point, the Amsterdam Museum went into the neighborhoods or when a museum is closed, it's often you do a pop-up something. Or, uh, but in a, in a broader sense, uh, you're also, of course, or we are and most museums are also um, busy with outreach. So not just getting the people in, but also going out and uh, the Jewish Museum Berlin has a has a bus that's called uh, JMB on tour uh, because Germany is so big. It's not like the Netherlands; you can get anywhere in two hours by train. Uh, but um, Germany is so big that the school classes that come are always just in you know from the lender from the lande in the buurt van Berlijn and niet. Uh, Niet ver weg. Dus dan gaat het museum in met die bus met, uh, met tour guides en met een mobiele tentoonstelling. Okay, okay. No, no oh, and I speak Dutch. Yeah, I have this all the time when I'm in Germany. <laughs> I never know anymore what I'm speaking because I speak German there and then I speak to somebody English and then I continue in English. So this is <laughs> this happens all the time. Um, yeah, and so with this mobile exhibition, interactive exhibition, uh, we go to schools like really far away from Berlin. So that's an that's then more uh, national. Or, uh, but we also opened into twenty one a very beautiful children's museum, a children's world, Anoa, it's called. And there we also go with uh, with a kind of buck feeds into the into the neighborhoods in Berlin to tell the story to, to tell a story that is told there about the Ark of Noah, but also to to bring uh, the the Children's Museum into the uh, into the neighborhoods, and we also go to uh, to. Um, uh, crèches, kindergartens, uh, because it's from three till ten, also to the basis school, primary school. Um, 
and there's a lot of community work also being done. So we have a lot of uh, what we call out and in reach uh, because it's important to try to reach people that maybe don't come uh, automatically or okay um, by the way if you want to ask questions this is a dialogue so you're open to ask questions and interfere in the discussion um, it is it is a dialogue on dutch and german uh, culture and the exchanges uh, so that is a very interesting aspect uh, as well, because you both uh, traveled uh, to the other country, so to speak. You started to study here, and uh, could you tell something uh, about the, the, the dense scene, the climate here in the Netherlands? Is it, was it and is it different than in Germany? Well, it's uh, for... At the moment, I, I cannot really say it so much because I'm not uh, now so regularly um, here. Um, but it has been important for at, your education. at that time in the yeah. 80s. I think uh, it was there was a very large scene, and there were many um, also alternative theaters, um, uh, and um, I think there was a. A very creative climate, uh, I, I remember. Mm, the school, mm, I was in the modern department, the school for um, modern dance, or school for new dance development. It was called later, at our, in the beginning, was called even just modern dance department. Mm -hmm. um, this was exceptional, I would say, in Europe, because um, it was really experimental. Um, and uh, in Germany existed not uh, such an um, education at all. You could either do classical dance um, or, or go to Folkwang, which was more in the... Um, well, Pina Bausch was in Wuppertal, and <clears throat> there was more the lineage of the um, modern dance, expressionistic dance, and also classical. So, and the department here was in that way so open and brought so many uh, young artists um, that from the States, actually, so from New York, but also from the West Coast, that were doing like everything post-Cunningham. Uh, so the whole um, judging church um, people, um, Simon Forti had at that time a big exhibition at the Stedelijk Museum, for example, and then taught also at the school and some students actually were even performing um, so there were Im really important artists um, also musicians uh, so it really opened also for contemporary music Pauline Oliveros was for example um, also teaching there so um, for me it was a very clear choice because I wanted to study that kind of dance. I didn't want to become a classical dancer. I really was looking for that information. And in Europe, there was only one other school in England. Um, and so it, it felt like an island, a very special creative island, uh, with main, really many opportunities of I exceptional artists uh, that we had workshops with. You lived here for four years, I think? Yeah. And you didn't like, want to stay, you wanted to go back to Berlin? No, no. Okay. I, I'm, I'm born in south of Germany. I didn't want to yeah. go back uh, to Germany, actually. I didn't think I would go back to um, Germany at that moment. I wanted to go to the States, and from here I went to New York. Yeah. So, and yeah. But uh, I, I think the... Um, I think it had also, there were many young groups, there were, uh, were a lot of independent um, dance makers. Um, I think there was also quite a good subvention system at that time, I remember. And we, one could see from the outside that the subvention would go down and with it, I think, also the dance scene declining. So I think there is a relationship between funding and uh, creating a... Uh, a dance scene. At that moment, um, there was still the wall was still up in in Berlin, so I didn't uh, want to go back or, or didn't want to move there. I went after the wall came down because I thought it was not for the dance, 
because there was hardly anything, but for more for being there and this historical moment and seeing these opportunities. Um, and many artists um, did that also, so it was a very um, vibrant um, climate. But the dance scene then was very minimal, and now I must say it's very, very vivid um, in, in Berlin. Many people from all over the world are gathering, and there are many studios and a lot of exploration. And finally, there's also an education, kind of experimental education. Yeah. Yeah, from the Dutch perspective, it, it looks like uh, Valhalla uh, in the sense that you have, I don't know how many, but uh, man, uh, many permanent uh, employees uh, compared to the Dutch uh, situation where uh, you know, all the, many artists have flexible jobs. Uh, and for example, in the cor Corona period, that was re a real problem uh, uh, because they didn't get compensation. Uh, so the, the, the cultural climate in Berlin seems to be very well, well developed thanks to the subvention system or? I, I think actually the, <clears throat> the possibility after the wall came down was to have very cheap housing, mm -hmm. um, have studios, uh, very cheap ateliers and, and uh, possibility to work. That gave many people the opportunity. So for example, we founded Sophie in 1996 which was empty and we, we developed it and created a theater. So there were many initiatives and uh, <clears throat> I think the subvention also developed and I think it's not so bad, I would say. I think there can be, it can always be better if we compare it to other subventions because the cultural factor is the almost, I think the second largest um, uh, of uh, actually, um, of people working, you know, we, we, we have to remember that. And we always think of ourselves as artists, you know, we are like, you know, kind of a minority or something. No, we, it's not. And, um, but the subvention is there, okay? I, from my side, I can say it's, it's good. I'm lucky after 30 years, I have a stable uh, funding. Um, I have eight permanent dancers and I, I have a, a structure. But I don't have a, um, a space where I can, like a theater where I constantly show my work. So this is still a problem. But what I wanted to say, going back to Amsterdam, I still, the SNDO has also developed and um, it is still a very exceptional education. And many great artists have come out of there also. Uh, Jefter van Dinter, for example, and uh, Florentina Holzinger, she's, um, She's Austrian, she has studied there, who is also now a young, very experimental artist. So they all studied there. So I think there's the, the educational system is creating a ground of very fruitful dynamics, but um, then a lot of times all the people leave their, the, the, the place where they study. I don't know how you... Which is a pity, of course, yeah. yeah. No, part of our lives, no? To move, yeah, to get new... Indeed, but for the Netherlands <laughs> it's a big pity <laughs> for... <laughs> Hattie, you, you have been working, or you worked for, I think, more almost 30 years at the Jewish Historical Museum and have never been thinking, I suppose, that you would become a director of the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Uh, but you had contacts with uh, the Jewish Museum before. What was your impression? Uh, I mean, you visited, but you didn't visit the, the empty building, you, you, you said, but uh, what were the big differences between Amsterdam and Berlin? Yeah, there were always many contacts, not just with the Jewish Museum Berlin, but with basically all Jewish museums in Europe. There's also kind of association where we see each other like once a year with a conference, and so there are many contacts. There are also exhibitions that are being uh, created together, or we take an exhibition from one of the others, or it, we send it. So there's always a lot of... Uh, uh, but for me, in the museum in, in Berlin, I mean, there were all, also an exhibition that I made once, went there, and I visited several times, of course. Um, 
But for me, Germany and Berlin was always something like a bit uh, uh, <laughs> frightening uh, still because of the history. So, I mean, I had never visited Germany only for profession professional reasons for now and to go to see Pina Bausch in Wuppertal when I was at the dance academy that I think was the first time I went there um, and um, I was also not so I mean I was, was very acquainted with the museum but not so much with the cultural scene in Germany but what helped is that um, my partner uh, <coughs> Photographer Frederick Brenner, he was at the Wissenschaft Kolleg in 2016 17 for one year, and then I also joined him for six months. And then I lived in Berlin and I got to know, um, yeah, the Berlin and many, many actors in the Jewish scene. And uh, so it was a kind of introduction to Berlin, but then often people asked me, you know, because I was going there for six months, they said, oh, don't you like Berlin? Wouldn't you like to live there? And I said, never in my life. <laughs> I would never want to live there. I mean, I liked it for a few months, but no, I don't want to live there. So it's pretty funny that I'm now living there <laughs> uh, and that I got this job. Um, but it's it's very different. I mean, compared to... Um, as a society, I find it much more formal uh, than than in the Netherlands, especially within a, within institutions, uh, working relations uh, tend to be much more formal, and that's something that I've been trying, and I think I succeeded to change in the Jewish Museum. I think in cultural institutions is already less than in in other institutions, but um, and I like to to work like uh, as they say in German of Augenhöhe, so kind of more um yeah with more equality not because i'm the director you know i know how everything should be no i mean i need the team uh, and i need the people they have the expertise and you know we have it's it's uh, it's also teamwork so i think less top down i think that's also very dutch um and um it's also more bureaucratic but it's also because the Jewish Museum Berlin is a national museum and it's funded by the federal state. And the Jewish Museum here in Amsterdam is a is a private foundation that is that gets money from the government, but it has its own board, etc. And I I uh, am accountable straight to the Minister of Culture. So it's a very different. And you have you have the ministry, you have all the. Um, yeah, it, it, it's very different, but uh, it's a wonderful place, and I enjoy it very much. And the cultural climate in, in Berlin, is it possible to create new spaces, a Jewish cultural quarter in Berlin? Well, we have it. We, in a way, we have that, because mm -hmm. it's, um, there is the, the old building, uh, the Collegian House, the Baroque building with the extension of Daniel Liebeskind, but across the road there is the former flower wholesale market where there's a, an academy in it, a library, archives, seminar rooms, and now also this ANOA. So it's already like a lot of buildings and space and different um, um, different um, accents that are being put in those different uh, uh, buildings. Um, but what is, of course, I mean, compared, I, may, I know I've worked here in the Jewish Museum for a very long time. We never had any money to do a project. So before you could start anything, you had to do a lot of fundraising. And if the money didn't come in, you had to scale it down. And there we have just a fantastic budget from the government. Of course, we have... We do fundraising and we have we have several you know quite a lot of money still on top of it that we fundraise for extra projects, but the basis is there. you can just start making an exhibition, you can hire somebody I mean this was in Amsterdam it's so different, so I feel that I'm in such a luxurious position. I also always tell my colleagues from you know Jewish museums in other countries that I know what a struggle it is just to get your 
you know, your budget uh, together to, to do your normal programming. Uh, so in that sense, I feel very privileged and that gives, of course, a lot of freedom because you have time for other things than chasing the donors <laughs> all the time. Yeah. It seems to me a more political position in Berlin in the sense that uh, a, a Jewish museum in Berlin, also in this political climate with the AfD, uh, I think is, uh, it, is, it is really an important building in in, uh, in 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 Germany and in, and so your position is also uh, m perhaps even more important. It's also more to the east, more close to Poland and Hungary, for example. Uh, do you feel this pressure as well or not? Um, well, I don't really feel it as a pressure, more like a task. Yeah. Um, and and that is a that is a very big difference uh, because the. Museum when it was founded in or opened in 2001, it it is really like a political historical gesture of the German government that could only have happened after the uh, reunification of Germany to show this this history so important for us that we have one of the three big historical institutes, the Deutsches Historisches Museum Haus der Geschichte in Bonn, that is for post-war. Um, history and then the Jewish Museum. These are the three um, houses that tell the history that have a very important educational uh, task from the government. And that that was, of course, a sign that they had this huge, huge building, new building um, dedicated uh, to the Jewish Museum. And um, in that sense, it's also very, it's very, uh, we are very observed, everything that is done in the Jewish Museum. And um, the, the, the themes about the whole National Socialist past, uh, about the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, these are all themes that are very, very present in German society and also in all the discourses that are being made and in, in the... Um, newspapers, what is being discussed. So, and in a way, you're right in the center of all that. Uh, but I see it more as my, um, I try always to keep out of the, not to have be active in these discussions, but by um, um, contributing to these discussions in the programming that we do. Not because Hetty Berg has to say something in the newspaper, because, you know, my opinion, I think that's not so interesting. I think it's much more interesting the work that we do in the museum and how our programming reacts to these very important issues that are played out in a very, very <clears throat> deep way in Germany today. Do you also have some, uh, in the same way, a, a political message perhaps in your work or... I, I think, um, I, first of all, I, I do think that our art uh, is already political and if you work with the body also, it's um, also, an, um, <clears throat> you cannot avoid to, um, to talk about many different um, issues. So uh, it's over the years I have more like focused on certain questions that interest me, but um, lately, let's say maybe middle, like maybe 2015, maybe more strongly um, through the big refugee crisis that hit Germany, um, I really felt the need also as an artist to be more more actively involved to share also our artistic strategies and and um, give give away um, like to 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 open that um, because I think um, uh, when we create um, there are it's kind of problem solving when you make a piece 
I don't know if you, you also when you I think when you create when you make a exhibition it's like you you have a you have a task you have a focus you have a content and then you um, many obstacles arrive and um, there's a certain openness and a, a, a fluidity how we are solving problems also I think as artists but maybe also as working with the body and for me it was um, it was important that we as a company and me as an individual also uh, give our, um, yeah, give our, mm, our means or what we have learned. So I, I started to work more also with uh, refugees and I created a platform that I called Suhern, which means uh, listening. Um, and uh, where art and um, institutions, uh, a lot from the civil society, could uh, mix and present themselves and share, and a little bit like a weird conference or uh, something where we didn't really have a name for it. And um, I started to um, do that every year because I thought it's important to give that more space so with different uh, tasks or different topics so also one on the climate crisis also sometimes inviting specialists and always mixing mixing science and art and um, um, doing experiencing but also receiving and listening so kind of changing how we are um, how we are experiencing it. I mean, this is actually a little bit, this is kind of close to what a museum, I think, is also doing. Um, so that, that interests me, and I think it's also absolutely important. And the longer I go, the, the more important I find it um, uh, to, to be active, not only in my work itself, but also what we do. And like, for example, the education program, for me, it's very important, you know, to give that uh, information of uh, dance and or consciousness with the body, it doesn't even need to be dance, to children and a younger generation. So we have three groups from like six to 18 they go. Um, and uh, this is also part of somehow my engagement into society. Yeah, you have much in common. This is the educational program. <laughs> there is a question. I'm uh, wondering, is there a kind of Jewish community yes, uh, now in Berlin, and do you cooperate with them? Is it part of Jewish life, your museum? Uh, there, there are many Jewish communities in, in Berlin, and also many, many Jews that are not part of the Jewish community. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, Sasha mentioned, like... Uh, uh, that many people were coming to uh, to Berlin uh, after the the wall came down. There's still many people coming to Berlin. Also, many many Israelis uh, because they say Berlin is a cheap Tel Aviv, um, and uh, sometimes also for political reasons. But the big group that uh, forms the Jewish communities today are the people. Uh, are the Jews from the former Soviet Union. And that is, uh, the, um, let's say, after, after the Second World War, there were about 30,000 uh, Jews in Germany that were not the Jews that used to live in Germany, but mostly displaced people, displaced persons, I mean. And uh, every a decade, another, like in the 60s, uh, Jews came from Poland. Uh, in the 70s, Jews came from Iran. There was always another, another migration. Uh, but the, really, the big group, of course, are the former uh, Soviet Jews, and uh, but also people from all over the world, um, because Berlin is still an exciting city with a lot going on. But I've also heard that many people now go to Leipzig, because Leipzig, Berlin, also became. Uh, many artists 
Berlin also became expensive, so you cannot afford so easily a place to live. It's certainly not an atelier if you're an artist. So now they say it's also um, already shifting now to uh, uh, more towards the east. But yeah. of course we... we, we uh, sorry? Dresden also, yes. Uh, but uh, of course we... we uh, we work also or cooperate with the Jewish communities and, uh, yeah. There's another question, yeah. I have a question to Sasha Waltz. Um, you like bodies and you said you, the body stores knowledge. You said you want to give the knowledge that is in the body. And I was wondering about your work with the dancers. If you consider or see the body as actually an archive, uh, stored knowledge, you said some Israeli dancers from the third generation comes. How do you, it's a tacit knowledge that is in the body, that's stored in the body. And I was wondering, how are you working with your dancers to get, is this just something you do instinctively is this uh, or is it coming out through the movement or are you also um, talking and discussing this what what is stored in there and how you get this from inside out there is a lot of discussion actually there's a lot of talk um, so um, I, I do think that there's a lot of um, memory stored in the body and um, it depends very much on the content, what we're researching. Um, and I have people from many different um, backgrounds, you know, and they're each, each of their um, memory and also their approach to communicate, to, um, I don't know, to, to even to approach a problem is so different. Like if I work with a Chinese dancer, for example, and a Polish dancer, or, you know, it's very, um, it's for me always very interesting how different an answer, a physical answer can be. And I really try also to leave it like that. I try not to uh, unify it. For me, it's, it's exactly interesting what we can find through this different, to, to this diversity. Um, now, um, as we created many uh, pieces, you know, the many pieces are written into the bodies and the body becomes like a, a, an artistic archive also. So um, for sure we have video, but it, the body is still the the most important so it's very important to give the information from from the dancers generation to the next one this is something that is very important um, because there are so many things you can not really exactly explain and you really need to to be it and the closer you are the more you see it the more you are alive with that person that does it um, the deeper or the closer you get to what it was. But if you uh, think about, like, let's say, traumas or, or something like this, I haven't worked on that, um, so I don't know about this. Uh, I have not um, especially uh, focused on this. Yes. Mrs. Waltz, you didn't directly answer on the question of Hanko uh, that, uh, or you would make an, uh, uh, a new performance uh, in the, uh, uh, not in the empty building, but in the building with the collection. So that's, that was one thing was, thank you first for your conversation, that's uh, uh, to start with. But might be, if you look for an empty space, it will be confronting, it will be very, uh, I think it will be a lot of people against it, but it will be also uh, very challenging that uh, uh, it might be that uh, you make a new performance in the Holocaust monument 
on the Potsdamer Platz or near there. That is. <laughs> I see you thinking it is. Yes, I know it is very confronting, but but it is uh, it might be an, uh, uh, a challenge, and also what you said, and that was uh, impressive. I thought that you said from we want to bring also the arts to the city, and I think art must sometimes be confronting. <laughs> I agree that the art uh, should be also confronting, but I don't really, I can answer that, that I don't feel the necessity to make a performance there because I think the people that are visiting and are experiencing it, they are actually already, um, let's say, the thought of the artist. They are already in a certain way... Um, I mean, they're not performing, but they are in their own imagination there and everything is working. We don't need to show something more. This is what I feel. I think I'd like very much to also, if I think of a city, sometimes I like also spaces that are like the backsides of spaces or forgotten spaces or, you know, um, when we were in Mal this um, big place where everybody came together, one person of Mal said, like, this is the most ugliest place of the city. They neglected this place completely because it was the backside of a, a supermarket. And uh, it was also the border to social housing that was across the street. So it was kind of a a hangout place, but I thought it's very interesting and it rewrote it so that people also acknowledged the space. And actually it was meant by the architect as a theater. It was great space, fantastic from all four sides, even with little stairs, you could see it. So I think it's, I'm sure there will be many other things, but it's just, um, let's say why I would not want to um, not, not that I don't want to confront myself. I think I will confront myself also um, in, in other ways. Um, I think I said it. If I look at the Oderberger Straße, I'm a bit completely on the side. I've got another question. I don't know whether it's more for uh, Hattie Bear or Sasha Waltz. I'm not quite sure, but uh, we will see. Uh, <clears throat> what I was thinking about, I'm standing in front of the class as a teacher, as a German-German teacher here in Amsterdam. And what I see not only in front of um, Dutch classes with Dutch pupils, but also from my German friends who are standing in front, who are teaching in Germany, that uh, the question is uh, of remembrance. Uh, on the one end, I see, well, what I ask myself is how can we keep remembrance vivid, kind of making it fluid, kind of, to, to keep it seem and appear relevant for the day of today? And how can we, on the other hand, prevent of making it, well, it, uh, for example, the Shoah, the ultimate Zivilisationsbruch, uh, the ultimate uh, breakup with civilization, how can we, on the other hand, prevent of saying, well, it was some event somewhere and it's a it's long time ago. How can we prevent relativizing the Holocaust and at the same time contribute of making it fluid, vivid and relevant for that time? I hope that this question is kind of clear what I mean, because for me it's a very, very difficult balance. I have at, at my classes, I'm speaking about a, 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 a version of Todesfuge from Paul Celan, and I try to make close reading very, very little steps because it's a foreign language for them. And I, I always, it's always adjusting and it's, it's very difficult. Perhaps, I don't know, who would like to answer, but I would really like to, to get to know that for, from a lesson practicing, kind of. 
Uh, well, I think this is a, a question that we all struggle with and that is very difficult uh, to answer in general. Um, I, I presume that uh, if you have Paul Ceylan Todes Vogue, that you're kind of at uh, in, in education um, that is preparing for for university or yeah so that is already certain um, um, for certain group of pupils so that also all depends on who you have in front of you but I think it's always uh, and then you're you know you're a teacher of German so you're already in this um, but it also has to be taught in in very different context and I think what is the uh, what is the challenge to find the hook for those pupils to be able to relate so that can be um, that they use the digital monument, the Jodh monument here, and look what happened in their own street. Or that um, I'm sure yeah, many pupils nowadays also ha or have um, experienced themselves certain things or migration, etc. So to always first try to connect to their to their experience before trying to to um, um, I say it for me uh, the um, uh, these uh, difficult contents but yeah this is what we try also to do of course in in the tours and the educational uh, programs in the museums, and it's it's not uh, it's not easy. I mean, you also have groups that totally um, 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 don't want to hear about it, uh, and then you need other other entrances to to discuss topics. But uh, yeah, I think it's uh, uh, it's a very important task, but I cannot give you a very clear cut answer. <laughs> Because I don't have it myself. It's all, I mean, it's a search and it, it changes all the time, of course. Okay. If there are no questions anymore, I think we come to a closure. And uh, I hope this was not the, the first meeting and that it will be the beginning of perhaps an, a, a friendship or uh, in. Not the last meeting. Not the last meeting. Yes, sure. sure. <laughs> Yes, and uh, well, uh, I would like to thank you very much for this very open conversation, a form of dialogue. Yeah. Maybe we can see it. Sorry? Huh? Maybe we can still see the trailer. Yeah. The... You would like to show the trailer. Okay, thank you very much for all your questions. <laughs> mm.